Have you ever encountered something so disturbing, so unsettling, where you thought to yourself, man, I need a drink after that? Well, today's cocktail brings to life one of the darkest practices in human history. Fortunately, it was also the inspiration for one of my most popular cocktails with a flavor profile of cherry, tequila, benedictine, and a number of additional ingredients I'm sure you're going to love, despite what inspired them. Welcome to the bar, where we make insane cocktails inspired by history, like this one. Mm. This delicious cocktail is a mouth-watering treat that will make you feel as if your heart will beat right out of your chest. So, let's go behind the bar, appease the gods, and make this ultimate sacrifice in liquid form. Our tale begins with a young man walking toward the center of his city. With each step, the weight of the world grows heavier on his shoulders. He feels a great responsibility for the traditions of his people that have given his country power and abundance. However, if he doesn't make it to the center square by sundown, all of that could be lost. In the next few minutes, his actions could bring about an end to his world or stave off destruction. He had a delivery that couldn't be late. In his hands are a worn, damp rope, taut as he pulled, wrapped around the neck of his prize, a captured warrior to be sacrificed to the sun god, Huitzilopochtli. Our young man hurries towards the massive temple with fear in his heart, his breath racing with excitement, but with the sun still casting shadows. He knew he made it. He hands off his prize to one of the temple priests, stepping over pools of blood flowing down the temple steps like water. He watches his captured warrior disappear among the thousands of others surrounding its base, all to have their hearts cut out of their chests in order to appease one of their most important gods and bring peace to his nation once again. I know what you're thinking. You made a cocktail inspired by that? Yep. This is Eat Your Heart Out, a drink inspired by perhaps the most infamous aspect of the Aztec Empire, human sacrifice. Look, not all history is fun. Some of it is straight up horrifying. As Chinese philosopher Lin Yutang once said, human history is not the product of the wise direction of human reason, but is shaped by the forces of emotion. Our dreams, our pride, our fears, our greed, and our desire for revenge. Sadly, the Aztec human sacrifice had a little bit of each of those components, but it was a critical component to their survival and eventually was a catalyst to their demise. Fortunately for you, I've been able to turn one of humanity's darkest moments into an incredibly delicious cocktail. I'm serious. At my private events, it's one of my most popular. It's crazy. So to start off our cocktail, we have to encounter one of the more disturbing aspects of this Aztec ritual, blood. And for that, I chose grenadine. Why? Because grenadine is a particularly sweet, syrupy, pomegranate, simple syrup. Uh, now, mind you, for your drink, you can use roses. This is perfectly good. It's very bright color. But for a little bit more complexity, I decided to make my own grenadine, which includes pomegranate molasses, pomegranate juice, and my own uh, ratio of sugar in order to give it a little bit more viscosity and a little bit more sweetness, which I think is going to really improve the body of our drink. Now, as for our blood factor, I'd say that looks pretty blood red, which just adds to the whole aesthetic that we're looking for our drink. So this is our first ingredient in the list that will go into this cocktail. And as is the case, we want to make sure that we introduce all of our ingredients and put them together at the end. That way I give you guys the freshest cocktail possible. So we have it and we'll put it together later. The scope of these Aztec rituals, where tens of thousands of people died in ritual human sacrifice, 
where the ruling class were celebrating by eating their victims were hard to believe. For many years, historians doubted such bizarre claims because most of our testimony comes from the Spanish who conquered the Aztecs. But what if they were right? Imagine having been at sea for months aboard one of your country's finest sailing vessels. You and the crew are looking for new lands, new opportunities to find resources your country needs. Finally, on the horizon, you see the green of tall trees and the brown of welcoming sands. Your legs feel a little unsteady as they adapt to solid ground. And in the humid air, you hear the distant sounds of chanting, cheering, and screams. You follow the sounds into the thick brush and unwelcoming forest. The smell of flowers intermingled with the growing scent of copper. You break through into a clearing, astounded at the thousands of individuals surrounding a massive stone structure. Its stones appear to be weeping blood. Your eyes are drawn towards the top of the pyramid where you see what look like priests cutting the heart out of a living man. As the crowd around you cheers in delight, you reel back in horror. What sort of evil, barbaric land had you stumbled upon? That scene, or one similar, was what Spanish explorer Hernán Cortés first witnessed when he landed at what was today Central Mexico. His Catholic beliefs convinced him that what he was witnessing was straight up demonic. Now, if I had walked in on that, yeah, I probably would have grabbed my pants, vomited, and would have passed out. In that order. Don't lie, you do the same. Now, whether Cortez's tales were accurate or embellished, coming across the Aztecs' barbaric ritual firsthand would change, well, everything. And that brings us to our second ingredient in our cocktail. Since Cortez landing in Mexico brought about the European exposure to the Americas, we want to expose our cocktail to a little bit of European influence as well. And so we bring in Benedictine. Now, Benedictine isn't Spanish in origin, it's actually French, but it has a wonderfully complex and bold flavor that I think mirrors some of the actions that were taken by the Spanish. This is filled with a lot of different botanicals with very different flavors. It's a very spicy type of liquor and not spicy in the terms of like heat or capsaicin, but spicy in terms of actual herbs and spices like wormwood and uh, anisette and uh, mint and a couple of other ingredients that make up this very complex liquor. I think it's gonna add tremendous body, some extra character, and is going to really make this into a far more unique cocktail than just something that's a little bit more fruity. So, when we add this to our cocktail, we're gonna put in three quarters of an ounce because we don't want it to overpower anything. Hi! <clears throat> Hi. If you enjoy our historic cocktails and want to learn more about the history that inspires them, but you don't want your taste buds to suffer the many failed attempts it took to achieve this greatness, or you don't like reading books, then subscribe and let me do the work for you. I, I, I can't go that way. Cortez had come upon the most powerful civilization in the region. The Aztec Empire had over 200,000 citizens, and its capital, Tenochtitlan, the hub of Aztec trade and politics, resided on a man-made island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. It featured gardens, palaces, temples, raised roads, and bridges that connected the island to the mainland. The city was built in the middle of a lake because an eagle had landed on the original small landmass there. But the eagle did represent a major deity in Aztec culture, Quetzalcoatl, or Quetzalcoatl. So, to the Aztecs, it was as if this god had chose this location for the beginning of their empire. And so they went about making Tenochtitlan a city worthy of being the center of a nation. Tenochtitlan was so impressive, the Spanish considered it the greatest city they had ever seen. 
To know Chelan's power extended over neighboring city-states, requiring them to pay into the capital's public markets, as well as provide tributes to their religious center, the Templo Mayor, or Great Temple. And some of those tributes were human sacrifices. Unbeknownst to the Aztecs and the Spanish, the Aztec Empire would be Mexico's last great indigenous empire. But how would it end? We'll get to that in a minute, but first let's introduce our Aztec component to our cocktail. And for that I chose tequila. Tequila is uniquely Mexican, after all if you make tequila outside of the state of Jalisco, can't technically be called tequila. For this we have Jose Cuervo Tradicional. Why did I choose this one? Because this is known to be a better, more premium version of tequila than others. And for our cocktail we're going to put in a half ounce. Hey, come here. You ever had any pets? Dogs? Cats? Rabbits? Llamas? How about turkeys? No? No turkeys in your family's history? <laughs> well, that's not very Aztecian of you. You see, the first time the Spanish encountered turkeys was in Mexico with the Aztecs and the Spanish called them giant chickens. Makes sense. The Aztecs not only ate turkeys, but they may have actually had them as pets. Archaeologists found turkey bones along human grave sites, which may suggest that they could have been part of the family or a final meal at the funeral. Bones alone don't tell the whole story, but I'll tell you one thing that turkeys have that your pets do not, their own deity. That's right, Chalchitotalim was the Aztec turkey god, the god of the plagues. Okay, not, not the most honorable of titles, but I guess it's better than not having a god at all. And it's turkeys that inspired our next ingredient, Black cherry juice. Now, as it happens to be, turkeys and cherry go really, really well together in food and also it goes really well in our drink. You see, with the cherry juice, it does a great job of adding some very necessary tart to rather sweet and complex flavors already in our cocktail. And it is a little bit thinner than some of the more sugar heavy like these two. So it can balance it out, make it a little bit thinner, a little bit more palatable, while at the same time maintaining that wonderful blood red color. For our cocktail, we're gonna end up putting in one ounce of the cherry juice. Upon landing in 1519, Cortes established the colony of Veracruz. Moctezuma II, the king of the Aztecs, had learned from his scouts about the landing of these new visitors. Strange people with white skin and beards riding scary beasts, which we know today to be horses clad in protective Spanish iron. The Aztecs had never seen these animals before, and it terrified them. You see, Moctezuma was in the middle of expanding his empire, and so he didn't have the time nor the interest to deal with these new visitors. So, as was the cultural diplomacy of the region, Moctezuma offered them a small tribute of gold and jade. It was the Aztecs' way of saying, hey, we recognize you, but we don't have time for you. Now go away. Kind of like shooing away a salesman through your front door ring speaker, or a telemarketer who's trying to get you to extend your car warranty, or someone interrupting your vibe to tell you to like and subscribe. Hi, if you enjoy our cocktails and want to learn more about the history that inspires them, no, 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 and cut the elevator music. You see, this is what I'm talking about. You've already done this. I'm here telling my top shelfers all about Aztec history, and you come in barging in at my front door like a magazine salesman. So you don't want likes and subscribes. <laughs> Let's not get too hasty. <laughs> but not now. Now go away. Sorry about that. Where was I? Oh, right, Cortez. So he was looking for new resources for his home country and was shocked at the ease at which he could obtain such valuable treasures. So he wanted to learn more and reached out to Moctezuma scouts again. Moctezuma scouts, just believing that their original tribute clearly wasn't enough, showed up with more gold and jade in order to try to get them to leave. A second, thanks for visiting, now go away. Really? Cortez and the few within his team that 
somewhat understood some of the Aztec language, completely misunderstood the meaning behind these gifts, and it drove them to want to meet Moctezuma in person. Despite protests from Moctezuma's scouts, not that they fully understood what they were saying, Cortez and his men pressed deeper into the nation. It didn't take long for Cortez to come across blood-soaked temples. Fearing for the inhabitants' souls, Cortez threw lime across the temples and smashed their Aztec idols, replacing them with a wooden cross and a statue of the Virgin Mary. Cortez tried to explain his Catholic faith to the local inhabitants, but Christian ideas like the resurrection didn't exist in Aztec culture. There were literally no words to explain it. But Cortez did his best and continued on. The closer he got toward Tenochtitlan, the more he realized that Moctezuma was adamant he didn't want to meet with them. But Cortez had traveled too far to give up now, and when he and his soldiers reached the capital city, Moctezuma had them kicked out of his city and his country. And that would be the last free decision the Aztec Empire would ever make. And it's Moctezuma's persistence that brings us to the next ingredient in our drink, aloe juice. I know it seems a little bit unorthodox, but for this cocktail, it does a great job of being able to dilute a lot of the potent flavors here, balance things out, and add its own nice little vegetaliness to it. I don't know if that's really a word, but as you guys know, the smell of aloe, it's also kind of how it tastes when I try this out. It's very interesting, but this is also combined with a little bit of lemon juice to give it a slight tartness, but it is still very leafy. Uh, in its flavor, but it's nice. It thins out the drink because it's very watered down, uh, and it also will help us balance out this drink. For the cocktail, it's a great symbolization of Moctezuma's persistence and strength because this is actually going to hold up the rest of our drink without causing it to be imbalanced and out of touch. So, for our cocktail, we're going to put in one ounce. Moctezuma was a bold and strong leader but no empire exists without its enemies. Neighboring tribes, particularly the Tlaxcala and Sempoala, were tired of paying tribute to the Aztec king and decided to partner with Cortez and his forces to take down Moctezuma's army. Within two years of landing on the shores, Cortez had brought down a nation that had reigned for over 100 years. With a combination of superior weaponry and thousands of soldiers from disgruntled tribes, Cortez and his men reached the capital city of Tenochtitlan on May 22, 1521. Just 93 days later, the great city fell. However, as a final F.U. to the Spanish conquistadors, the Aztecs, knowing the Spanish treasured their gold and jade, rushed to the edge of Lake Texcoco and threw it all into the water, moments before dying for their empire. Before modern warfare, the world was ruled by those who conquered and those who were conquered. It was how empires rose and fell, like the Aztecs and the Spanish. And it's the fall and loss of empires that brings us to our last surprising alcohol. Vodka. Because the Russian Empire rose and fell many times and... Uh, okay, it's a bit of a stretch, but in reality I just needed a nice additional alcohol to add some extra punch while also not diluting the drink any more than it already has. For our drink we're actually going to put in a half ounce of vodka. So, let's get to making this wonderful cocktail. With our cocktail, we're going to start with the basics. So we're gonna have our bases in first. For our black cherry juice, as I said before, we're going to put in a whole ounce of black cherry. Now, like I said before, I really, really like this juice. This is Lakewood, so it's actually local to Florida. They're out of Miami, and all of their juice is organic, or at least the vast majority of them are organic, and uh, they're very, very, very flavorful. Uh, the only ingredient on the back is just juice, and that's just great, and I think everybody should get into that. Next, we're gonna put in uh, an ounce of the pure aloe juice. So, like I said, this stuff is wonderfully unique. Yep, that smells like a plant. Smells like a succulent. Maybe our drink will be succulent. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Next, we're going to put in a half ounce of our vodka with Stoli. Now, mind you, I also had mentioned before Russian vodka. This is actually Latvian, but you know, here's the thing about Latvia. It was part of the USSR, so I am not going to apologize for saying that it was Russian, because at one time it was. Sorry, Latvia. Put in a half ounce. And then we're going to follow that up with three quarters of an ounce of Benedictine, because now it's really for time for us to have our European element here. You know what's interesting about Benedictine? It never smells like it tastes. And to expound more on it, this has such a complex flavor profile that you would imagine that it would just be overwhelming smells of herbs and spices. Nope, nope, smells pretty much like alcohol, but then you taste it and you're like, oh wow, that's quite a shock. Next, we're gonna put in our half ounce of tequila. Oh yeah, it's that bittersweet smell with all tequilas. And that comes from the fact that, you know, it's the agave plant, so there's already that kind of bittersweetness to that plant. And uh, it's actually derived from the base of the plant too, where most of the sugar is. If we took it from the leaves, it would start to taste more like this guy here. Lastly, we're going to put in uh, a splash, just a splash, we don't need much more. You know, if you wanna make it super syrupy, you can do that, of our grenadine. And this one just smells of pomegranate and dates. And that comes from the pomegranate molasses I actually used to help make this. So just that, that should be fine. I think this is more than enough. And now we just put in some ice, grab the second half of our shaker, wrong second half. Am I crazy? Maybe we do that. There we go. I'm a professional mixologist, I swear. <laughs> and we shake. That sounds, that sounds shaken. So much so that I can't speak. Get that out and present our wonderful martini glass. I think this really looks good in a martini glass. Uh, just the bold color of it, it looks classy. Now we pour. Perfect, and finally, to top it all off, we have to garnish it with our own heart that we're gonna eat out with a nice Luxardo cherry. Skewered, I think that sounds appropriate. And there you have, eat your heart out. It looks wonderful. Let's give it a taste. There's a reason why this is my most popular drink. It's just so well balanced. It's cherry, it's sweet, and the alcohol is so subtle, but it comes in right at the end, right? You feel the slight burn from the alcohol, right? The tequila here isn't really overpowering. The vodka isn't really overpowering. And you're kind of expecting that with a half ounce of each, right? But the Benedictine just adds a little bit more complexity to that cherry juice, right? Because the cherry juice is already providing a decent amount of sweetness. The pomegranate is providing a decent amount of sweetness with the grenadine. But then that Benedictine, there's just a subtle amount of botanical bomb flavor that's coming on the back end that starts to really come in towards the back of the tongue. And you're like, wow, what is that? And I'm sure it's similar to the experience of being conquered by the Spanish, right? You're having a good time, things taste great, nice, well balanced, everything is good. And then all of a sudden there's, oh, there, that, that's there, that, that's the Spanish. I guess it's just gonna overtake the drink. But mind you, at the same time, for this drink, we didn't want it to be too overpowering. If you wanna add more, you can always do that. But this is just such a well-balanced drink. Tasty, fruity, not too potent. I could have three of those. But hopefully, not to the point that it causes me to do really, really barbaric rituals. <laughs> And of course, we have to eat our heart out with the eat your heart out, right? Mm. I love Luxardo cherries. They're just the best. 
totally worth it. Invest, eat your heart out. There's your drink. For this drink, we want to give a little small tribute to all those who died in the Aztec rituals, as well as to all those who died in the conquests of empires, whether they were indigenous or whether they were European. This drink is also for you guys, because after all, going through all of that, you realize that history really is better with a drink. Cheers. <laughs>